Well, good morning. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Christian, and it's a privilege to be um, sharing God's word with you here today. Now, today we'll be finishing our series on Ephesians uh, with chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. Now, if you're new here today or have just joined us, welcome. Now, today you're actually in luck because although this is the last part of Ephesians, it's actually a summary of the whole letter. So we'll be touching on a lot of key themes in Ephesians. You're kind of getting a condensed version of the book. It's like if you remember in uni when you skip lectures 1 to 11 and just attend the review lecture at week 12 with all the important points for the exam, that's what you're getting here today. But before we get into that, let's talk about a groundbreaking movie that was released in 1999. Let's talk about The Matrix. Now, what makes The Matrix interesting is its plot. Now, I'm going to spoil the movie, but you've had 20 years to watch it. So I think there's a statute of limitation of five years when it comes to spoilers. So here's the plot. The main character is a programmer called Thomas Anderson. His gamer tag, or hacker name, is Neo. Now, he lives in ordinary life. He works a normal job. Lives in an apartment, wakes up late for work, gets scolded by his boss. By all accounts, his life is pretty mundane. Until he meets Morpheus. Now, there's this famous scene where Morpheus offers Neo a choice between the red pill or the blue pill. The red pill is the truth about the world and life, that things aren't as it seems. And the blue pill is to believe that only this life and reality that you see is all that is real and continue living in that truth. Now, after taking the red pill, Neo is shown the truth. He comes out of his sleeping pod, gets disconnected from the matrix, and it turns out he's not living in a time of peace. He's living in a time of war, one between machines and humans. And the rest of the movie is about fighting that war. Now, why am I talking about the Matrix today? Well, throughout the book of Ephesians, we've been given wonderful truths and practical instructions. We've been taught how through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we've been saved by God's grace through faith and how it's a gift of God, not by our own works. And we were taught how this reconciles us to God and reconciles us to each other. Then, we're given practical instructions on how to live it out by putting on the new self that imitates God. And in the last few weeks, we were talking about how to walk in love by loving our spouses, submitting to one another, how to honor our parents and bring up our children in God, how to obey our bosses and show no partiality to those we lead or manage. Now, when we think about these things, we may think Paul is just giving us a list of things to believe and do to be a good person. And if you're not a Christian and you're listening to this, you may think these are just common sense morals, aren't they? These are just morals and ideals about how to live a good and peaceful life in mundane suburban life in Melbourne. That's all it is, isn't it? Well, in our passage today, Paul is going to wake us up from that illusion. He's giving us the red pill. You see, friends, Paul hasn't been writing this letter to prepare us for a peaceful, mundane life. Paul has been preparing us for war because the reality is we're living through one right now. Some of us just don't realize it. Now for this sermon, we'll talk about three aspects of our warfare, who we're fighting, how we're fighting, and how we advance. So let's pray before we pop the red pill. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you God for your word to us today. Father, we appreciate that um, the topic of war is particularly sensitive today, given what's happening in Ukraine. Lord, we pray for peace in that region and restoration for the families that have been um, affected um, and broken through that. Lord, help us see through this passage that our warfare is not as the world fight. We fight by ushering peace between God and man and ushering peace between humanity and each other. And help us see that today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, let's begin. Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. <clears throat> 
So Paul begins here with a finally, meaning this is his last instruction before he closes the letter. And he uses this passage to elevate the urgency of everything he's written before. So we've been on the ground here considering how to have loving relationships with our family, friends, and work colleagues. We've been thinking about how to imitate God and put on the new self. But now, he lifts up our eyes to show us what's at stake. We're in the middle of cosmic warfare. And he tells us to put on the armor of God so that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, my second point will address the armor of God. But first he tells us why we need to put it on. It's to stand against the schemes of the devil. And he clarifies it emphatically. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of evil. Now, before we get into who our enemy is, I want to make two things clear. First, this war against Satan, it's not one where there's like two equally powerful forces and we actually don't know who's going to win in the end. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 to 20, 21, Paul actually already says that through the resurrection of Jesus, he has been made to reign over all powers and dominion in heaven and on earth. So Jesus has already won. He reigns supreme even over evil and the devil. Now the question is, if Paul talks about Jesus winning over all powers at the start of Ephesians, why then is Paul talking about fighting against the devil at the end of Ephesians? Is he being inconsistent here? Well, it's because although Jesus has already won through the cross and resurrection, the full victory of Christ won't be fully realized until he returns. Now, what's that like? Um, in World War II, there are actually two days that we can talk about when it comes to the victory uh, of the Allies over Europe. It's uh, D-Day and it's VE Day. So D-Day is the day where the Allies successfully invaded German territory. Uh, if you watched uh, Saving Private Ryan, it was that beginning scene in Normandy. Now that day was the decisive turn of the war. See, the Nazis' days were numbered from that day forward. They were still there, and they still fought back, but they were going to lose already. Now, VE Day is the day called Victory in Europe. It's the day Victory in Europe was declared. And that's when the Nazis unconditionally surrendered and the war was officially over. So what we have in Christ through the cross and resurrection is D-Day. Christ has dealt the decisive blow against Satan and his enemies. It's a matter of time before they lose. But they're still around. So what Paul is calling us to in this passage is to continue the battle, knowing that full victory is definitely ahead. Now, the second thing I wanted to clarify is that in our battle with the devil, we're not fighting for our souls or salvation. If you are in Christ, your soul and salvation is secure no matter what. John 10, verse 28 to 29 says, Jesus says, nobody can snatch any of his people from his hand. So this battle is not for your souls. You are secure in Christ. What then is this fight about? Well, this fight is about being effective in pushing back the powers of darkness that still exists in the world in the form of sin, oppression, and abuse. We see it all the time in the news. It's about liberating those who are still captive to the devil and his lies. Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 2, those who follow the prince of the air like we formerly did. So the war may have been decisively won in Christ, but we have the privilege and honor of realizing that victory in the places that we live and work and spreading that victory to the people that we love. Okay, now that we've clarified that, let's go to the text. First, Paul tells us who we are fighting and who we are not fighting. Verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against cosmic powers of darkness and spiritual forces of evil. By flesh and blood, Paul basically means our enemy is not other humans. It's not other people. Our enemy is Satan and his forces. Now, if you're listening today and you're not a Christian, you may be skeptical about this whole conversation about the devil 
you may think this is the age of modern science. We don't need this superstition about Satan anymore. Everything can be explained through natural causes. And you're welcome to believe that. I'm not going to spend time trying to prove Satan's existence. However, I will say that based on this text, without belief in Satan, I think you don't have the resources to respond to evil in a healthy way. And this is because if you only believe in what you see, if you only believe in the material world, then unlike Paul, you have to say our struggle is against flesh and blood because flesh and blood is all there is. Our enemy has to be other humans who oppose us. So ironically, by not believing in demons, we demonize each other. But as Christians, we have the resources to resist this impulse by seeing the devil as the enemy and not others. But we all have the tendency to treat other people as enemies, don't we? And this is exactly what Satan wants. Divide and conquer, that has been an ancient tactic used to win wars for centuries. It basically involves creating divisions among people to prevent alliances and weaken their power. It involves fostering distrust and enmity between potential allies. Now, by doing that, it's easier to overpower smaller groups now that they're not united. And Julius Caesar actually used this tactic to conquer Gaul, which is modern-day France, in the Gaelic Wars. Gaul's military actually matched Roman's power during this time, but there were internal divisions between Gaul's tribes, which Caesar exploited to win the war. And Satan uses the same tactic for us. He divides us by making each, us see each other as the enemy and not him. Now, we are all made in God's image, but we often demonize each other. So, Christian, who have you been treating as your enemy lately? Let's think about this in the context of what we've learned in the last few weeks. Have you been seeing your boss or your uni professor as the enemy because of their ridiculous deadlines and unreasonable demands? Have you been seeing your colleague or your classmate as the enemy because they badmouth you to others or take credit for your work? Is it your children that are the enemy because they just refuse to listen to you? Or is it your parents who just don't understand who you are? Is your enemy your spouse who doesn't know how to love you like they used to? Or is it your friend who's betrayed your trust? Who is your enemy, Christian? Are they flesh and blood? If they are flesh and blood, well, Paul says they're not your enemy. They may have sinned against you. They may have hurt you. There needs to be confrontation and difficult conversations over that. But they aren't your enemies. Satan is. Now, telling you to stop seeing particular people as your enemies is easier said than done, isn't it? It's easy to say our struggle is, again, is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. It's difficult to actually believe it. Because we can see flesh and blood with our own eyes, can't we? That friend, they really hurt you, didn't they? Or your colleague or boss, they're actually visibly hostile towards you. Or the family member that you're thinking about, all they do is judge you. They put you down all the time. So how then do we have the resources to see those who hurt us not as enemies? We find those resources in the gospel. Firstly, I think sometimes we're afraid if we don't keep them as our enemies, they'll get away with what they've done to us. That they won't be responsible for the harm that they've caused. But the death of Christ shows that God will deal with all sin and evil. If God did not spare his own son when Jesus took on our sin, that means there will be a day where every person will bear the responsibility of their wrongs. So not seeing them as enemies won't put them off the hook. We surrender that justice to God. And if the person you're thinking about is a Christian, well, Jesus has already paid their penalty. Now, secondly, and more importantly, we must remember how we were treated as enemies. See, because of our sin and rebellion, we were enemies of God. But Romans 5.10 
says that while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. So this is how God treats his enemies. He sent his son to die for their sins so that they may become friends with God. Now, if we're to imitate God, Ephesians 5.1, then we should go and do likewise. Now, that's with respect to flesh and blood enemies, fellow humans who bear God's image. Paul does, however, want us to oppose Satan and his evil forces. Now, previous passages talking, talk about having harmonious and loving relationships between husband and wife, parent and child, bond servants and masters. But there is actually one relationship you do not have to have a harmonious one with, and that is your relationship with Satan. So if you love relationship drama and conflict, and you miss it as a Christian, please feel free to have a dramatic and conflictful relationship with Satan. Scripture encourages it. If you used to ghost people a lot and you're just itching to ghost someone right now, please, go Satan. Ignore that guy. Please feel free to be toxic towards Satan. He is your enemy. In fact, the worse your relationship is with Satan, the better your relationship will be with God and everyone else. So recognize that your enemy isn't any other person, despite their sins and evil. Your enemy is Satan. So now that we know who our enemy is, how do we fight against him? Let's continue Ephesians 6, verses 13 to 17. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, there's two important ideas that Paul grounds this passage in, the armor of God and standing firm. Now, in verse 13, we are to put on the armor of God for the purpose of standing firm. So the armor is to help us stand firm. But what does it mean to stand firm. There's a military phrase called holding the line. That's basically when the frontline shoulders, soldiers brace to withstand an attack without moving from their positions. If you've watched uh, war movies, it's, it's that scene where one force charges the other defending force and the defending force basically braces for that charge. Now holding the line is important because if the front line breaks, the other troop behind them are in jeopardy. So frontline warriors are to stand firm. And he wants us to be the same. No matter how the devil attacks us, which will be in numerous ways, Paul wants us to be unmoved, to remain firm in Christ, in the gospel, so we can repel the enemy's attack. Now if that's the case, how do we stand firm? Well, it's by putting on the armor of God. Verses 14 to 17 details the different armor pieces. Truth, righteousness, gospel of peace, faith, etc. And all of these things that Paul talks about actually have been discussed earlier in the book of Ephesians. So this is actually a summary of all the important themes that Paul has talked about throughout this letter. Now, since you've likely heard a sermon or at least a chunk of a sermon on each of these themes, I'm not going to go through the ground level practicalities of each. We have our sermons on Spotify and YouTube. You can go back and listen to the relevant parts in Ephesians. However, I will talk about how this armor repels the enemy or how we fight. Now, the armor, can, the armor pieces can be put under three headings. Paul is basically telling us that we fight by, one, believing the gospel, two, living the gospel, and three, declaring the gospel. Now, believing the gospel. Verse 14, Paul's first piece of armor is the belt of truth. Now, it's the first piece of armor because this whole war started with a lie. If we go all the way back to the beginning of our Bibles, we remember this war started when Satan deceived Adam and Eve and they fell into sin 
And this established the pattern of how sin and evil spreads. First comes the lie, then the sin, and then the shame. So sin starts by believing a lie. Satan's first war tactic wasn't a battle formation. Satan's first war tactic was propaganda. Now, if you're not a Christian and you're listening to this, you may have wondered, why do people sin? Why do people commit evil? Now, here's our take on it. There is a lie that you believe in about God or about yourself that tempts you towards evil. For Eve, she believed God was withholding something good from her. For you and me, it could be about self-worth or love. You may believe you're not worthy of love unless you're beautiful, unless you're successful, or unless you're good. Now, if that lie is lodged in your heart, it will tempt you to sin when those things that you think make you worthy of love are threatened. When you see someone else more beautiful than you, you become jealous and you may bully or gossip about that person. When you fail or have a me mediocre career, you self-loathe and become resentful. Or if you like the identity be in being good, when you slip up, which you will, you blame shift and gaslight. See, for Eve, she thought God was withholding something from her, so she took the forbidden fruit into her own hands. So first comes the lie, then comes the sin, and then comes the shame. For Adam and Eve, they realized they were naked and hid from God, when the reality was they were always naked, but before, they were naked and good. Now they know God sees their nakedness and their sin. So after you sin, you feel naked too. You realize that you indeed may not be worthy of love because you aren't a good person. And that shame drives you deeper into the lie. It makes you commit more sin to cover it up. And that brings you more shame. The vicious cycle continues. And as you sin against others and they sin against you, evil propagates and everyone spirals further into the lies of Satan. But we have the belt of truth. Ephesians 1.13, the truth is the gospel of your salvation. See, we believe that the truth of God is that you are loved regardless of your beauty, regardless of your success, and even regardless of your goodness. We believe this because the gospel confirms it. Romans 5.8 says, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not while we were still innocent, not while we were still good, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this is the first piece of God's armor, the belt of truth, that God loves you no matter what you've done, are doing, and will do. And he's proven it through the death of Christ. So repel Satan's lies with this. Believe the gospel. Now Paul then proceeds to talk about the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace, and the shield of faith. And in these three pieces, Paul encourages us to live out the gospel. Notice the words. He says, put on righteousness and put on the gospel of peace. Do you guys remember what else Paul asked us to put on in Ephesians? It's in Ephesians 4.24. Paul asked us to put on the new <coughs> self. So when Paul talks about having righteousness, here he's repeating what he talks about in 4.24, the new self, which is true, good, and beautiful, which we've heard about a few weeks ago. So this is living out the gospel. By living it out, he's merely saying what 4.24 and 5.1 is saying. Imitate God. Live in a way that imitates God so you may reflect him to the world around you. And when he talks about the gospel of peace, he's talking about probably evangelism, which will be discussed in my next point. But I want to emphasize the peace aspect. Paul wants us to live as people who are, as Ephesians 2.14 puts it, both at peace with God and at peace with one another. How do we live at peace with one another? We talked about that the last few weeks. How to live peacefully between husband and wives, parent and children, and bond servants and masters. So Paul is actually really summarizing all of his teachings here. What then about the shield of faith? 
Well, the shield of faith is appropriating God's promises to our lives. It overlaps with believing the gospel earlier. But the shield of faith uh, particularly talks about extinguishing the flaming darts of the evil one. See, there will be times in your life, Christian, where in your spiritual walk, you'll be attacked more than usual. There will be times where you will doubt your salvation, doubt God's existence, or you'll be tempted to grave sin and maybe even fall into it, maybe even more than once. There will be times where your faith will be deconstructed, either through rational inquiry, a cold heart, or betrayal of a loved one. And it is in those times that faith is the shield that will extinguish flaming darts. We are to live in faith as we challenge and question it. And lastly, we're to declare the gospel. Verse 17, we are to put on the helmet of salvation. So we're actually first to declare the gospel to ourselves to protect our mind. See, when Satan wants to accuse you and um, bombard you with lies, we must declare the gospel to ourselves to remind us of our identity in Christ and the truth of the love God has for us. Martin Luther said this, When the devil accuses you and says, You are a sinner and therefore damned, we should answer, Because you say I am a sinner, I will be righteous and saved. No, says the devil, you will be damned. And I reply, no, for I fly to Christ, who gave himself for my sins. Satan, you will not prevail against me when you try to terrify me by setting forth the greatness of my sins. On the contrary, when you say I am a sinner, you give me armor and weapons against yourself, so that with your own sword I may cut your throat and tread you under my feet. For Christ died for sinners. As often as you object that I am a sinner, so often you remind me of the benefit of Christ, my Redeemer, on whose shoulders, and not on mine, lie all my sins. So when you say I am a sinner, you do not terrify me, but comfort me immeasurably. So when Satan accuses you of your sins, be comforted in Christ, who has died for it all. Now we're also to declare the gospel to others. Paul says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, you may think the Word of God here means the Bible or Scripture. But in the Greek, he's actually using a different word than what's commonly used for Scripture. When it comes to written word, it's logos. But here, Paul uses the word rema, the rema of God. And that means the spoken word, the word that is spoken and declared to others. Now, this does include evangelism. The shoes of the gospel of peace does mean declaring the gospel to those who don't believe, but it also means declaring the gospel to other Christians. How often do you encourage other Christians with the gospel? See, the gospel isn't just for people who don't believe, you know. See, any of us throughout the week, we often need to be encouraged to either believe the gospel or to live it out. And we can all speak a word of encouragement to our brothers and sisters in Christ to remind them of this. So this is how we fight. We believe the gospel to repel Satan's lies, we live out the gospel to stop evil and to spread good, and we declare the gospel to protect ourselves, to build up fellow Christians, and to liberate non-Christians from the lies of Satan. Now you may be thinking, this is a lot of things to do here, to put on the armor and fight. Am I going to be able to do all of this? Can I really resist Satan and his forces? I can bar barely resist the temptation for a midnight snack. Now let me remind you whose armor this belongs to. You see, the text doesn't say put on the armor of Ferdi, or the armor of Aaron, or the armor of Jedi. The text says put on the armor of God. This armor actually belongs to God and is from God. Paul is actually drawing armor language from the book of Isaiah. And there are a few verses where it's at, but um, we'll just look at Isaiah 59, verse 17. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. Those words, they sound exactly like Ephesians, don't they? But who is the he here? Well, you can read it in your own time, but this chapter is actually talking about God putting on armor as he delivers his people from exile. 
So God put on his armor to save his people from exile. But later in Isaiah, the Messiah also puts on his armor to save God's people. So God puts on his armor, liberates Israel from exile. Jesus puts on this armor and liberates his people from sin. So do you know what happens next? He gives the armor to us. So all of this gear that we have, all of this armor, we have it in Christ as we believe in him and live out our lives for him. And it's with this armor that we are to go and tell the gospel to all the nations so that they may receive the victory that has been won in Christ. Let's continue Ephesians 6, verses 18 to 20. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth to broadly proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now, since we've been talking about armor and standing firm, you may have gotten the impression that as Christians, our general posture is defensive. We're kind of trying to protect ourselves from Satan's attacks as he bombards God's kingdom. Now, that's not true at all, actually. See, remember, through his death and resurrection, Jesus has already won. And in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says that on the, the confession that he is Messiah, he will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell. Notice the word, gates. You see, Christians, Satan is not at our door. We're at his. Christians, we're not defending God's kingdom. God can do that. We're actually attacking Satan's. If Satan is attacking us with fiery arrows, it's because we're at his gates. Don't you remember the movies? The archers, they're in the fort, in the castle, shooting arrows because their castle is being attacked. That's where we're at in this war. Now, how then do we advance? It's through prayer. If you've watched a lot of war movies, you're probably already familiar with the many different roles in an army platoon. There's the medic, the rifleman, the sniper. Sometimes there are flamethrowers. Those are pretty cool. But do you know who I think is the most powerful person in a platoon? It's actually the communications guy. It's that guy that carries the big radio. See, in a few movies, the objective was actually to get that radio guy to a place where they can pinpoint a building or a stronghold. And once they find that stronghold, communicate the coordinates to the base so that either heavy artillery or the Air Force comes to bomb the place. So it's interesting, isn't it? Where the other units use their own weapons and skills to push back the enemy, the comms person calls on the greater power of another to utterly destroy the enemy. And that's what prayer does. This is why in verse 18, Paul calls us to pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Go all out. Pray for everything you need in Christ to withstand Satan's attacks and to push Satan back. Keep alert. Be aware of the many things that you can pray for. There's a situation in Ukraine, the floods in Queensland and New South Wales. There are many things you can pray for to push darkness back. We're not limited by space when it comes with prayer. Make supplication for all saints. Pray for your mates in Christ. Give them more ammo. Pray for the areas where their armor is weak. Verse 19, pray for boldness to preach the gospel and boldness for others to preach the gospel. Verse 20, Paul ends with saying, he's an ambassador in chains. Now it's interesting that after a sustained paragraph on spiritual warfare, he closes as an ambassador. You see, to Satan and his forces, we may be enemies, but to people and to those who don't know Christ, we are ambassadors. And that's actually how we plunder Satan's kingdom, by being ambassadors to people and liberating them from the lies that they've believed. We compel them through the gospel to follow Christ as he reigns victorious over Satan. So that's Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. We're at war, at war with Satan, 
but we've been given both the armor and the power from God to fight and advance as we plunder his kingdom. I hope you've seen that we don't fight the war with darkness using violent weapons of destruction. We're not called to be demon slayers or exorcists. We fight evil with good. We fight as our commander Christ fought. Jesus, who when tempted, he declared God's word, who when cursed, he blessed, and when betrayed, he forgave. Jesus, who when the world put him to death, he offered eternal life to those who repent and believe. And it was in his death that he won victory because through his death, he disarmed Satan. Satan has no weapon against you, Christian, for in Christ, your sins have been atoned. In Christ, your shame has been covered with the righteousness of Christ. And even if Satan were to tempt you with death, in Christ, you will rise again. In Christ, we fight a disarmed foe with the full armor of God. The gates of hell will not prevail against us. So let's charge the gates now. Let's pray.